You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available in the iTunes and Google Play stores. Select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the options insider.com. Welcome to Volatility Views, the premier program for volatility traders. Each week, we'll take a deep dive into the world of volatility with in-depth analysis, trading activity reviews, strategy breakdowns, cutting-edge education, and much more. We'll also bring you exclusive conversations with the traders, researchers, and asset managers who are reshaping the volatility landscape. If it involves volatility, then you'll find it on Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by Myax, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. Myax is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility Products. Spikes Options and Futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction, all for ultra-low exchange fees. It's Volatility Reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. Volatility Views is also brought to you by Matrix Executions, LLC, an agency broker-dealer focused on best execution in trading workflow automation. A technology-driven firm, Matrix is led by trading pioneers with decades of experience designing and building best-in-class solutions for options markets. Matrix connects to all domestic exchange venues and multiple international exchanges and serves both institutional and individual clients. For more information on Matrix Executions, LLC, please visit MatrixExecutions.com. And now... It's time to take a deep dive into the world of volatility. It's time for Volatility Views. All right, everybody. That music means it is Friday. It is noon central, 1 p.m. Eastern. Do you know where volatility is? Well, let's find it together. It is time for Volatility Views. My name is Mark Longo from the Options Insider. Dot com, as well as, of course, from the ever compelling, at least we hope so, Options Insider Radio Network, reminding you, if you like what you hear, this show, anything else we do throughout the week, pretty much close to a dozen programs hitting you all the time here on the network. Make sure you keep rating and reviewing wherever you do find this content. It really does help, particularly now in these crazy, tumultuous times out there where people are, are looking hither and yon for sources of information on these markets. Of course, keep those questions and comments coming, too. We do love to hear from all of you folks out there. Let's see who we're hearing from on the old program today. First, I'm pleased to say we're going back out across the pond in the Mayax hot seat. I'm happy to say we are joined once again by the Spikes father himself, waking up bright and early to join us on the program today, Mr. Simon Ho, the CEO over there at T3 Index and the creator of a product we talked about once or twice here on the show, Called Spikes. Simon, welcome back to Volatility View, sir. Oh, thank you very much for having me, Matt. Wonderful. Happy to have you on as well. And also joining us, holding down the Matrix hot seat this week, the Oracle of New Hampshire, the creator of all the cool earnings data you folks devour all the time, particularly this time of year, earnings season. None other than Mr. Matt Amberson, the founder over there at Orax, aka Options Research and technology services. Mr. Matt, welcome back to Volatility Views to you as well, sir. 
It's great to be on. And, uh, you know, I've worked with Matrix for a long time, so it's great to be representing them. Uh, of course, uh, being here with Mark again and, and Simon, it, it, it's great. And uh, I was on my podcast of choice and did a search for options. And it's all the Option Insider Network. So it's great to be here with you <laughs> and the Option Insider Network, Mark. We dominate the space, sir. That's the nice thing about having created the first ever options podcast. It kind of gives you a little street cred in the space here and of course last but not least joining us from the used to be snowy then it's warm again who knows what it is right now let's find out he is the greasiest slash most texan of meatballs mr mark sebastian from optionpit.com by way of carmen lion capital by way of a little john trader thing near you or actually now it's robin hood trader now i do believe mr meatball welcome back to the program sir hey good to be here what a what a day huh what a uh what a week and uh yeah, the sun is shining, and uh, it's a beautiful day here in uh, in Texas, Texas. Yes, Texas, Texas. Yeah, you're right. What a week, I think, is a good way to encapsulate it. So let's get to it. A little bit of the old volatility review. It's time to break down the latest developments in the volatility trading world. It's time for the volatility review. All right, everybody. Welcome to the Volatility Review, the portion of the show where we do just that. We dive deep into the volatility action, the unusual activity, the trades, the trends, the developments that lit up the volatility tape throughout the week and indeed are continuing today. And it's been an interesting week, I think, to put it mildly. You know, this time last week, we saw vol a little bit more bid. The market's a little bit more topsy-turvy as a result of all these yield fair concerns coming into this week. It seems like folks have maybe put that a little bit behind them. Markets have mitigated that a little bit. Of course, we have all the good vaccine talk on the horizon there as well. And the combo really seems to be lifting most people's spirits coming into today. Today is one of the few days where the market's a bit mixed, taking a little bit of a break from the endless nonstop enthusiasm that has been pretty much the rest of the week. Coming into today's show, we're seeing a little bit of red, a little bit of green on the screens today. NASDAQ, as it is wont to do once again, leading the charge this time to the dark side, off about 1%. S&P off about a quarter of a percent, and the Dow in the other direction, up about half a percent. Though, as we were talking on the Option Block show yesterday, you know, the Dow of today is such a different beast than it was even a few years ago. You know, the notion that the Dow used to be the sleepy old world index. You know, there's Apple, there's Microsoft, there's Walmart in there now. It's very much a different beast than when it was just the GE dominated Leviathan that it used to be, you know, like GE and AT&T, and that was kind of your Dow in a nutshell. <laughs> a little bit of a different beast these days. And of course, all that mostly green on the screen throughout the week means mostly red on the vol screens coming into today's show. Spikes come into showtime was a little bit shy of the 22 handle, about 21 and three quarters. Puts it down about six points from our last show. Yield, VIX cash a little bit lighter, down to about 21 and a quarter when we kicked off the show. That puts it down about exactly six points as well from where we were this time last week. And VVIX, the vol of vol, was at around a little bit north of 120, about 125 on our last show coming into today's show at about a 112, puts it down about 13 points. That's down quite a bit, but there's a limit to how low VVIX can get when the vol is moving. I mean, you can't argue that vol isn't moving right now. It may be declining and decreasing, but that's still movement at the end of the day. So a lot of stuff to analyze, a lot of stuff to parse. Let's go around the horn the way we started. Let's start all the way out there across the pond. Mr. Simon, a lot's been lighting it up in the world of vol these days. So what has been lighting up your tape, sir? Well, I suppose... Um if, if I may be so bold, I, I guess I'd like to reference uh, a vol trade that hasn't happened before. So um, last week, we've been working for quite some time, um, as you and probably the listeners know, um, to develop vol products in general. Um, one of the ideas that we settled on was to create a volatility index for Bitcoin, given the prominence that crypto seems to be getting and the, the, the extra impact and lots of people have lots of eyeballs on it. It seemed to make sense to build the first one. So we did. We built it. It's called um, the T3 BitVol Index. Uh, essentially, it is constructed in a way that's not dissimilar to standard volatility indices. So it's a sim it's a, we use a simple variance swap calculation and uh, we get the data um, in real time. And the, the beauty about this particular market that maybe people from equities don't appreciate is that this is a, a genuine 
365 um, uh, business. It trades all the time, all, all around the world, and there's basically, basically no break. I think there's a there's a tiny window uh, on a particular Friday um, at 8 a.m. UTC where you know that everybody can sort of take a little bit of time to sort of reset their computers or whatever. But essentially, it's it's a nonstop market. So the news from us, I suppose, this week was that yeah, we created a, a brand new asset class where people can trade volatility off of, and we actually managed to execute the first OTC trade. So as a customer did a, a March expiring one by two call spread. Um, the the numbers are pretty mad. That the strikes are 135 and 150. That's vol. So you know, it's, it's <laughs> that's like much that's at the money vol in Bitcoin <laughs> these days, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, yeah, very proud to have got it done and, and got a very good reception for it. And you know, we look to expand upon that in the OTC space, but also um, in the near future, we're going to have it uh, hopefully listed as well. So yeah, that's that's the, the highlight of, of my week at least. You and I chatted on the Crypto Rundown not too long ago about the inception of this BitVol index. And it seemed like at the time this was still in the inception phase. It seemed like it had a little bit of a ways to go before you you would actually start disseminating, let alone put up your first trade on it. So I know you said it went up OTC <laughs> really quickly. Walk us through how, how did it get to the tradable phase so quickly? How, how did this happen? Well, it was really um, – we, we had an interested um, party on the buy side. Um, we worked with – so there, there's a company you, you obviously know of and most people would know. It's called Ledger X, which is a crypto exchange uh, in the US regulated by the CFTC. Um, and they're doing some, some really great things. And they, they have a, a, a – there's two parts of that. One of it is the actual exchange and the other is the market-making arm. So that's really how we got to – be able to get this done because they they make markets in, in crypto stuff and th- even for them though this is a this, uh, this is a departure from the norm because as i said no one's traded bitvol itself before lots of people trading the actual crypto coins themselves but um they stepped up to the plate and they they put a price on the on the package and the customer did it so <laughs> it's a, a bit of dumb luck i suppose but also uh, a lot of trying a lot of hard trying they have to really push hard to try and get this done because let's face it no one's ever done a bitvol trade until now and so you know, it does take someone with a bit of kahunas to, to do it. And, and I congratulate them for it. So, yeah, very excited. Yeah, you're right. Every firm is always hesitant to be the first one out of the gate. Right? They always want someone else to test the waters before they dive in. So you're right. They, they deserve a bit of a tip of the cap to being willing to dive in there. And you guys, you know, once again, T3 pioneering some interesting stuff in the vol space. We're going to do a lot more of a deep dive into that on Monday, listeners. On the crypto rundown, I'm going to make Simon wake up early. Leave me a little bit less early for the crypto rundown. It's a little bit later. For that precise reason, a lot of Aussies used to join us on that program. So it'll be a little bit easier for him there. So we'll get into more of that. Again, it's the, it's the first of its kind listening. We'll talk about volatility trades here and volatility options trades for an entire hour here on this show, usually. But this is the first time that's been done in the crypto space. Perhaps a sign of some interesting things to come. And also how the mind share and conversation has evolved. Around crypto, people are interested in slinging the vol now, which is pretty fascinating. Before we roll off really quickly, Mr. Simon, anything lighting up your tape and catching your eye in the world of plain old boring vanilla index vol, sir? Uh, Well, yes, I suppose it's the boringness of it. You know, you you look at the the VIX term structure and you look at where the the actual level of vol is today. It's 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 really quite weird. It's almost like it's a little bit stuck. Um, Not sure whether that correct as it should in that it should be lower or should be higher but um yeah i guess my inclination is that it has been stuck for a while around this level and i i actually think that we might get a bit of a a push down in the next week or so uh oh! Give me a little bit of a of a preview of your crystal ball pick. Watch out there, Simon. Someone else may may jump on that pick as we keep on rolling. Let's go back on out now to the Oracle of New Hampshire. Hey, I'm curious for you, Matt. I know you've been uh, watching the crypto space with a lot of in- intensity out there. So, if you have any thoughts on the the first ever crypto vol options trade, really that we could point to out there, that's kind of a fascinating thing. And then outside of that, what else is lighting up your tape in the overall volatility space these days, sir? Well, I love it. And I uh, congratulated Simon uh, when I uh, talked to him earlier. But can I ask him a quick question? Is it does your index use a lot of the strikes like all of the uh, non zero bit strikes or is it more at the money? Simon, could you help me out there? Yeah, so um, that's a very good question. So we don't go all the way down to zero, but we we try and capture as much as we can. And as as it turns out, there is a a plethora of um, 
of of data and strikes and you know they've got all sorts of really interesting stuff in the crypto space which frankly until recently i wasn't that aware of it you know it wasn't wasn't really my sort of bag but yeah so we use most of them um as i mentioned we use what's called a simple variant swap methodology it's 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 kind of the very best thing that you can use um and yeah so we use quite a lot of strikes and they've got weekly strikes they've got uh, daily strikes and monthly strikes so there's there's quite a lot of information that you can actually absorb from yeah. that market which oh, surprised me when i first looked at it yeah very cool so you know the historical volatility this is a 10-day volatility uh over the last few weeks has been as high as 166 and kind of as low as 40. so it's a volatility of the volatility <laughs> I, i'm interested because you know one of the things that has been catching my eye mark is and I was quoted in it with uh, is the VIX a bubble in a Reuters uh, commentary, and I was saying that one of the reasons that the VIX is high relative to what we would consider normal volatility levels is the extreme bid in the uh, calls and even the puts. So there's a lot of people thinking that this market's in a bubble buying puts, and there's a lot of people. Uh, that are uh, having to either hedge or follow this uh, retail change of skew dynamic that we've been seeing. So um, there's quite a bit of, of curvature in the VIX. And what that does is it brings up the wings and that raises the volatility of the of the wings and raises the, the level of the VIX. And so what I was actually looking at was in terms of, vi of realized volatility of, of the S&P options versus actual volatility that relationship of is not that high of the at the money it's, it's just what, what i think is driving in a lot is this this curvature so i was i was curious how the cryptos were were being measured because they have a they have a big uh, skew to the to the calls as well but you know i mean uh, this market is just going up and up and up and you know it's, we're just printing more and more money and uh you know more and more retail investors are coming in you know, we have uh, international clients. Uh, I'm waiting to get my $1 million in Bolivar from Venezuela, which is now worth 50 cents. And wondering, uh, uh, you know, if that's ever going to come to the United States, because it just seems like we're just puffing everything up and the market just is is floating. I feel like I'm floating, Mark. It does have that odd air of floating. This, of course, we were one day removed from the one-year anniversary of when things really kicked off from a pandemic perspective here in the U.S. course. March 11th was the day when the World Health Organization officially declared it a pandemic. And a lot of people that really hit home when the NBA canceled the season, people thought, wow, this thing actually has some teeth to it. Of course, the market had already been roiled up to that point, but it sold off pretty hard that day as well as one of those few days everyone talks about, the Dow, thousand plus point days. That was one of them out there. So yeah, it was interesting times. VIX closed, I think, north of 50, about 53 and a half. So a year ago, we were in a very different regime than we are right now. If we had said a year ago, you know, the things you just said, Matt, and the notion that we'd have, you know, north of half a million deaths and 30 plus million cases and everything else that we've mentioned over the course of the past year. And, oh, yeah. And by the way, the indices would be up, you know, 40 odd, odd percent from those levels. <laughs> you people probably would have laughed and said you were insane. Yet that is where we find ourselves today at the very tip of a very frothy and volatile market. Let's go around the horn back to the greasiest of meatball. Mr. Meatball, We'll get into all things regular vol, as I put it in a second. But I know you've been hanging your hat out in the crypto space for a little while now as well, working with the GVOL guys over there. So, hey, what are your thoughts on the, the first real crypto vol options trade? And then B, what else is lighting up your tape in the vol space today, sir? Yeah, that's, that's really interesting and exciting that you guys were able to get that off, um, you know, the, get the trade up. I'm, I'm just kind of uh, in my head thinking about how, the market maker uh, was it laid off his hedge. I'm assuming they found somebody just to do the straight variance, uh, you know, some sort of variance, or they they trade a strip of options against the the trade itself. Uh, Bitcoin at the money vol is usually hanging around, you know, about VIX levels. About 110 is where that implied volatility runs. So this is not ridiculously out of the money. And um, you know, I'm thinking about the customer. What were they hedging? Were they hedging a move in Bitcoin higher or a move in Bitcoin lower? Uh, because, you know, like Bitcoin is a lot like crude in that, you know, it, it when it moves, it moves and vol will, will completely explode. Um, so I, I was just kind of wrapping my head around that. When did, when does this, uh, when does this contract expire? 
so the contract expires on on the March expiry. So that the standard expiry for crypto options is the last Friday of the month at 8 a.m. UTC, which is uh, British time. So yeah, they still got they still got a while to go. Yeah, that's that's that, I mean that's just fascinating. Uh, and um, without I know you can't get too deep, but what was uh, I think people want to know. What was the reasoning for the customer wanting to do the tra- a trade like this? Why would um, what's the use case on uh, on doing the uh, options on Bitfall? What what what's the use case there? Yeah, I think it was more um, you know because we had that index out there and where you know we were I was speaking with the folks at um, Ledger Prime, so the market making arm. Um, obviously, I, that, that was one of the things I needed to do first. Who was going to make a price on it, right? Because it's never the index never existed before, and so you had to get someone who was willing to take a bit of a, of a guess. But they they have a counterpart um, that is a very a sophisticated um, crypto macro. Um, firm, and so they they really wanted to just get involved and be the first. So it wasn't like there was a necessarily a, a fantastic need to get this done for sure, because obviously it wasn't around before. But when the opportunity came to do it, yeah, they were very um, very gracious about it, and, and and they were really good. So they did a one by two, so they bought the one and sold the two. So you know they're going to make money if the if it does go up. Um, some interesting insights that go with that, though. We did a, obviously we do a lot of deep dive in terms of the studies of how it behaves. And um, as was mentioned before, this is this is a very high vol product. I mean, recently the Ethereum vol was above 200 when the when the when the crypto was first getting above um, um, 50k. Uh, you know, the vol on this thing was was humongous, and ETH vol is actually slightly higher. So, yeah, it, there were a lot of a lot of moving parts, a lot of things to consider. But they wanted to be you know the first on on any trade in Bitvol, and uh, I, I was very grateful to to to, to take that out. Interesting stuff. Mr. Meepo, anything to lighten up your tape in the traditional vol landscape this week, sir? Yeah, um, I'm continuing to be uh, just in in awe of the downside open interest on uh, VIX, the the 17s, uh, the 17s through 24 puts that expire on Wednesday. They still have just massive open interest all over the board on those names. And uh, my understanding is the market makers are short and the street is long. So, you know, I, and I'd love, I think Simon would know, would be a good, good source for this. Cause I know he's a, a VIX trader. Uh, you know, we, we know all, all the, the hot, the hot, uh, trade on is gamma squeezing. Can you see, could we see something like that? If, uh, if we start getting some downside pressure on VIX with the market making firms as short vol, as short put as they are on the 20s and the 21s and the 22s, could we start to see uh, some real downside pressure on the volatility index generated out of uh, options expiration next week? Uh, You know, as I think about it, I I think it's totally possible. And, um, you know, especially, uh, you know, triple witching, quadruple witching, which is uh, next Friday, has been pretty bullish the last few quarters. Uh, you know, if we start getting ahead of steam in the S and P, and and the volatility index starts starts taking a dive, uh, you know, could we create kind of a a uh, reverse GameStop uh, and and see VIX it for in VIX terms make a, a a pretty hard move lower toward you know nineteen or eighteen. And I had a feeling you were going to bring this up. This has kind of been your your pet theory for a couple of weeks now. The great sucking sound of the gamma squeeze sucking VIX back below the 20 strike. This has been kind of Mark's theory for a while here, Simon. I know we've seen it the other way. It's traditionally associated with these upside explosions and these crazy names like Game and others. But it could occur in other places. Again, not traditionally associated with the downside in VIX, but it's an interesting idea. Mr. Simon, what are your thoughts on that, sir? Well, I mean, I, I agree 100% with Mark because, I mean, when I first my first comment um, this morning was that I'm I'm quite surprised. It, it seems stubbornly bid to me at 21. I know you know this level is not exactly high, relatively speaking, but yeah, I, I agree 100% with uh, with Mark. I think that the, there is a, a real chance that it could should flush out, could flush out. Yes, to the downside. All right, let's keep on rolling. Interesting stuff. That would be interesting, listeners. Are you buying this uh, gamma squeeze to the dark side in VIX? Let us know. What you think out there? Let's move on out to all things futures out there. Let's go out to the VIX futures curve because it has been 
I think we've talked about it for a while now. Kind of weird. It's been in this strange plateauish type shape, and it's still hanging out there, even though the front portion has moved a wee bit uh, since our last show. Coming into today's show, we're seeing at the beginning of the show, the March future was a little bit north of a point north of the cash, about 1.1 points. That puts it about over one and a quarter points higher. Remember, that actually was at a discount to the cash last week because the cash was whipping all over the place. And the April futures at about three point premium to the cash coming into the start of the show. That's again about three points higher because they were about in line last week as well. So the cash has pretty much settled down, is what's that telling you? Of course, you go a little bit farther out, you get past May and you get back into that plateau landscape of the VIX futures where they hang out from like June pretty much through to the end of the year, right around that 28, up to about 28 and a half, pretty much down to about 27.90 or so. But in that right around 28 lock pretty much for the rest of of the year which has been fascinating to watch for some time mr meatball i know you've been paying attention to this vix futures curve it's kind of been like this for a while uh it's come in a little bit but anything catching your eye out there in vix futures land right now sir yeah you know um the slope significantly steepened out in uh m3 this week and and that's been the big change we had seen curvature between kind of the vix and m1 month one now we've got it between month one, month two. Uh, April is still trading at a nice premium to the cash, but is now trading, uh, you know, a little more within reason relative to to March, uh, and is now trading at a pretty steep discount to May. And May, and this is kind of the big change. May, which is M three, uh, is now trading at a nice discount to June. Um, you know, it has me wondering again. Uh, I hate to keep harping on this, but we get a little bit pushed lower in, in vol. I think we could see that whole curve uh, start to enter normalcy. Uh, you know, they, it was kind of cash that at cash month one had a contango. Then it was cash month one, month two. Now we've added the third month. And, uh, you know, if we enter the summer doldrums, uh, you know, some of the some back end spreads uh, in uh, in, you know, June versus July, July versus August. There is a, a decent amount of money to be made uh, trading against those if, if you're patient. Uh, that whole back end of the curve is asking to be uh, for time spreads. And frankly, um, you know, you could you could talk me into a May, into a May June or even an April May at this point because there is uh, lots of short time spreads out there. Uh, today, I actually set up a bear trade in in May uh, because. It's trading at such a huge premium, and you can start to see pressure building on the back end of the months. I think that, you know, this time in, you know, a couple of weeks, we're going to be talking about uh, curve normalization because it just feels like, you know, maybe that one year anniversary is is when everyone decided to say fat, fat of all, um, you know, and I, I can tell you that, uh, you know, the SIBO is cheerleading VIX futures dropping because they want people to start using them as a hedge. And. They just, uh, outside of a very near-dated trade, they haven't been very good for it uh, because vol's been so high. They want those futures back at, you know, 15 or, or 16. If your gamma squeeze theory is correct, we could be back there. Let's keep on rolling, see what's going on out there on the vol options frontier. Spikes options, we've been talking for a while about how that big three-way has been dominating the open interest. Looks like they came in and took off the vertical side of that three-way yesterday, actually. So they traded a 1,000 of the March 32 half, 40 verticals. Looks like they did it for 12 cents. Simon, my read of this was that they obviously still have the 28 put on a 1,000 times. That's their big position. This seemed like they were using the vertical to finance that put, and now they took the vertical off while it's pretty much vestigial at this point. Is that your takeaway as well? This was pretty much done to finance that put, sir, that vertical? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's that's my take on it. Yes, I think, um, and it's kind of nicely in, in line um, with what Mark has been talking about too. So, <laughs> I think it's a, a good idea. Well, certainly, given the way things have lined up this week, it, it's kind of hard to argue with with a little bit of downside. And that's that's pretty meaty downside. The twenty eight puts. Uh, <laughs> that's that's pretty beefy out there. Let's see if things are beefy, perhaps meaty, perhaps even dare I say it, meefy out there in VIX options. I don't think today qualifies from a volume perspective as very meefy. Only about 330,000 contracts on the tape coming into the halfway mark of the show here. The ADV, though, is looking a little bit more robust than it did last week. Remember, we were north of 700,000 
couple of weeks ago, last week, it got annihilated down to about 630, almost 100,000 contracts came off the ADV. So that was a pretty big cut. They got some of that back this week. It's about 20,000 more, up to 652,000. So a decently robust week out here in VIX options. Before we start breaking it all down, let's let's break down where the action is, where the hot, sizable positions are in VIX land right now, the top 10 size positions in VIX options. By the way, it costs you about 157,000 contracts to break into the top 10 right now. That's that's about average. That's not really high nor low, really. And that gets you all the way to the March 18 puts. By the way, if you're wondering, there are a whopping two calls in the top 10. That's pretty much exactly the same as it was last week. So as the meatball was alluding to, it's still kind of all puts all the time out there. Number nine, 158,000 of the April 21 puts. Number eight, 167,000 of the March 22 puts going to be a lot of puts here, listeners. Number seven, 169,000 of the March 23 puts. Number six, buck 75 of the March 20 puts. Number five, our first of two calls, also 175,000 of the April 60. 60 strike. Getting some fascination with people out there. You'll see in a second. Number four, a buck 76 of the April 18 puts. Number three, our second and final call in the top 10, 179,000 of the March 60 calls. So, 60 strike. <laughs> Drawing the eye this week. That's an interesting one. Number two, 205,000 of the April 22 puts. Number one with a small bullet, 22, not quite a BB. Let's go 22. 222,000 of the April 20 puts. Total of about 9.35 million contracts open, about 4.7 million on the puts, and about 4.65 million on the calls. So the calls and puts net OI are also neck and neck, which if you know anything about VIX, of course, is fascinating because usually the calls are leading the dance by a considerable margin. Let's go on out here and see what was lighting it up here this week. Like I said, not the most active of days. 330,000 contracts on the tape. The top five trades out here this week. Most active contracts, or I should say today, 27, almost 28,000 of the March 21 puts. About 21,000 of the March 23 puts. 19,000 of the March 25 calls, 18,000 of the April 40 calls, and 17,000 of the March 30. So there are some calls sneaking in there in the most top five most active trades today. Yesterday, a little bit more paper on the tape, 498,000 contracts on the tape. Yesterday, the most active contract was the April 60 calls, doing about 37,500 contracts. So again, getting back to that 60 strike that clearly seems to have someone's fascination out there. Number two, 25, almost 26,000 of the April 22 puts. Number three, 23,000 of the June 24 puts. Number four, 21,000 of the April 20 puts. And number five, 21,500 of the March 22 puts. Going out to Wednesday, 769,000. That was one of the bigger days of the week, but not quite the biggest day. Uh, number one trade out there, most active contract was the April 21 puts doing 47,000 contracts, followed by the May 42 half calls, 46,000 of those bad boys. Then the August, first August we've seen in a little while, August 42 half calls. So again, 42 half strike, also getting some fascination. 42,000 almost exactly of those going up. Number four, 29, almost 30,000 of the April 60s. Once again, 60 strike, followed by 25, almost 26,000 of the March 60s, all going up the same day. Interesting stuff. Tuesday was the big dog of the week, 845,000 contracts on the tape. The most active contracts were the March 21 and 17 puts doing 148 and 129,000 contracts, respectively, followed by number three, the March 24 puts, 52,000. Number four, the March 22 puts, 46,000. And rounding out the top five here, actually a call, the March 28 calls doing 31,000. Monday, a little bit quieter day, 423,000 contracts on the tape. The most active contracts out there, 31,000 of the March 40 calls, 20,000 of the June 95 calls. Getting back to some of those weird farther out call strikes we've talked about before here. June 95 is doing 20,000 listeners. Number three, 17,000 of the April 22 puts. Number four, 16,000 of the April 18 puts. And rounding out the top five, 16K of the April 47 half calls. Mr. Meatball, I know you're watching the VIX options paper out here this week. A lot of interesting stuff. We got the 60 strike trading across the board in April and May. We also have some pretty sizable prints going up on Tuesday on this April. It looks like 20 or should be March 21, 17. So a lot of things going up, including the uh, June 95s 20,000 times earlier this week. Uh, what caught your eye out here in VIX options this week, sir? 
Yeah, well, our friend Russell pointed out that there was a pretty big backspread roll. That was those 35s and 42, uh, those 30s and 42s that traded in May and August. They uh, unwound a May back, uh, a May back spread uh, where they were short the 30s long, the 42s, and rolled it back to August, paying a net debit of 16 cents. Uh, yeah, Tuesday, those March 21s, 92,000 of those went up in one print. Customer bought bought 92,000 at once for 13 cents, uh, put up on a block. That that one caught my eye. We did end up writing about that in the VIX edge that I put out. Uh, and yeah, just uh, continued downside of Palooza. Uh, yeah, the, you know, the, we've got some active way out, upside in June. Uh, I noticed that the, uh, I believe the 105s and 110s are trading today. So uh, yeah, we continue to see some of this uh, far out of the money stuff trading, which is a little strange. Uh, you know, they don't seem really that interested in the 30s, the 35s, the 40s, you know, the ones that can actually make money. Uh, they're interested in these crazy out of the money ones that, uh, you know, I, I, I find a little unusual. Um, but yeah, um, again, just continued downside pressure uh, and, and downside speculation uh, on some of these really cheap and expensive options. And, and frankly, right. Let's talk about that 92,000. They paid a million bucks, you know, about a $1.2 million to get long 92,000 of those puts. And, you know, it, it, it doesn't really take that much imagination to see, to see the VIX get to 20 and a half or 20 uh, by the middle of next week. And uh, a trade like that, uh, from a calculated risk perspective, could make could net a, a lot of money in a very short period of time. So uh, that was one that I caught my eye. I I can I continue to be, uh, you know, had my eye on those twenty puts that were offered at a nickel all week. I just thought those were, uh, from a risk reward standpoint, just ridiculously inexpensive, and uh, did did in fact do a couple trades on that. Mr. Matt, I know you watch all things VIX options as well. In fact, you may have a few interesting questions of your own up your sleeve, sir. What's lighting up your tape in VIX options land this week, sir? Well, I I was interested in Mark's comment because I, too, think that the futures, is, you know, so high at 28 versus, you know, where VIX is. Um, and I, I wonder if I could ask Mark a, a question if, um, you know, if you could represent instead of just doing a, a calendar is there any way that you do like a call spread calendar or a put spread calendar? Obviously, since it's, you know, I usually dealt with single stock options, but now with, with VIX, you have, you know, di different instruments in each one of these uh, months. And so I like to be uh, neutral on units. Um, what would he yep. lean towards? What would you lean towards a call spread or put spread uh, calendar or, I would, or neither? I would do, um, I like your idea. Yeah, I would be looking at like a put spread and, you know, you could, you could, and we've done this, um, buying like a June in the money put and selling a July in the money put against it. Uh, so for instance, the, the June, July 30 put spread, uh, you could do that for, uh, potentially a little credit. You could definitely get a credit on the 35s, uh, and something like that basically turns into a, uh, you know, a future spread. But uh, the advantage of that is if you do the options, you, you definitely have uh, more limited risk than the flat future, than a straight VIX future spread. So uh, a trade like that, advantage of, you know, the steepening curve, one of my favorite trades and a trade that, that, um, you know, I, I have definitely, I will, I, I've definitely dabbled in over the last few, uh, few days and weeks. Right. Yeah, love it. I, my, I mean, my trade was always just the 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 VIX long put whenever uh, it was in uh, Contango. You know, so that was my kind of short two two weeks out forty delta something like that. Uh, yeah, back, as back tested, you know, very well over the over the years. And uh, but I, I I just I can't believe I can't believe these outer months at twenty eight. Uh, yeah, no. That, that's what boggles my mind, Mark. Well, some of the some of the trades that make a lot of sense, is, and and uh, that I really like are you can be in the money and out of the money at the same time. And I like these trades in April or May. So, for instance, the May trade I did today, uh, buying the twenty four puts, selling a, on a ratio of the twenty puts, and hedging that off with some 
some two cent 17 puts, uh, essentially putting on a, a butterfly. Um, I'm buying the 24 puts that are half bucks in the money relative to the cash and four bucks out of the money relative to, or two and a half, three and a half bucks out of the money relative to the future. I, I find those options have by far the most value. Uh, in April, uh, yesterday we were looking, you could buy the 25, 21 put spread. That was $2 and 35 cents in the money at the time. And you're essentially selling a 21 put that was out of the money at a relative to the cash and, um, buying a, uh, 25 put that's, you know, th- over $3, you know, $3 and 15 cents in the money relative to, uh, relative to the cash, but both options out of the money. Um, I find that there's a ton of value in setting up spreads uh, along those, those type of ilk. If you think that we're heading toward a, a trend of slowing volatility and uh, uh, falling VIX, which I do think we're heading toward. Well, speaking of falling VIX, uh, you folks like to sling a little bit of VXX when that is happening, and that's been popping off this week. VXX coming into a few minutes, goes at about a 1420, puts it down over a point, nearly a point and a half from where it was this time last show, listeners. So VXX is doing what you pay it to do, which is head on down towards that 10 strike where they're bound to reverse split it again in shades of GE. Only this reverse split makes a little bit of sense. Uh, about 202,000 contracts on the tape today. The ADV is about what it was last week as well, right around 376,000. That's about a couple of thousand contracts difference from last week. Not a huge change. Let's look at the uh, top positions out there in BXX land. Actually, right now it's 70 30 calls to puts out there. So calls losing some of their luster. It was 60 40. Last week, now it is seventy thirty. So one of the one of the calls bumped out of the top ten. Let's start number ten. Thirty three thousand of the March sixteen calls. So our first of three calls there at number ten. Number nine, another call. Thirty five, almost thirty six thousand of the March thirty calls. Three zero. Interesting strikes a foot out there. That's that's going to be challenging. <laughs> number eight, thirty six thousand of the March thirteen have puts. Then we got a whole bunch of puts here, listeners. Number seven, thirty six, almost thirty seven thousand of the March thirteen puts. Number six, thirty seven thousand of the April fifteen puts. Number five, forty one, almost forty two thousand of the March sixteen puts. Number four, forty two k of the March fifteen puts. Number three, fifty one thousand of the April fourteen puts. Number two, fifty five thousand. That's quite a few of the March 14 puts, but still it's, it's interesting stuff because number one with a bullet yet again out there this week actually has gained a couple of thousand contracts since last week are the March 20 calls, 89,000, almost exactly open out there right now. It's a little bit North of 90,000 a couple of weeks ago. So it has come off a little bit over a couple of weeks, but it's gained a few back this week. So the 20 calls, continue to dominate the tape out there. Mr. Meatball, I know you and your crazies and your pitch chat love to sling a little VXX. What's been lighting up your tape out there this week, sir? Yeah, you know, um, if when you plug it into our little nifty dipty contango uh, calculator, it's uh, got a, uh, a negative drag of about seven cents on it per day. Um, you know, there are uh, volatility, implied volatility on these options has really come off. Uh, VXX implied volatility while VVIX is still really high. VXX implied volatility is back toward uh, levels that we used to see pretty regularly pre-pandemic. So there are some inexpensive plays in, um, you know, some of the near dated uh, VXX and with it losing as much as it's losing there's, you know, there, I, I maybe put on some, uh, some bearish puts uh, in VXX uh, this morning. Just, uh, just saying. Maybe. <laughs> yeah, Not definitely, but maybe. Yeah, that's something I have been noticing over the past week or so as well, that definitely that vol has come in quite a bit. I may have a little bit of uh, VXX downside in my back pocket as well, which, again, a week like this, it's kind of hard to argue against that one. Let's see what's lighting up out there today. Uh, the big trades, top five trades out there today. March 14 half calls, actually, uh, going out today. 18,000 of those, followed by the March also going out today. 14 puts, 13,000 of those. Uh, March expiring on the 12th as well. 11,000 of the 15 calls. Then we go out to the regular March expiring next week. 10,000 of the 14 puts and 8,000 of the 14 calls. So the 14 strike, obviously drawing a lot of imagination out there. Let's skip off of UVXY this week because I want to get into all things earnings, volatility. We got the Oracle of New Hampshire with us here today. He is the keeper 
indeed the generator of all the earnings volatility data. You know, Matt, sometimes we get so hung up in all these macro volatility trends. We look past what's going on from a micro, indeed, a very fixed earnings volatility perspective. But you and I have been waiting for a long time since the pandemic kicked off, really, for the moment, the inflection point when earnings volatility would maybe make some rational sense. (laughs) And perhaps we would see some outperformance from an earnings vol perspective. And yet pretty much for the entirety of this pandemic era, we have seen the opposite vol just annihilated across the board. I thought for a while there early in this season that we were shaping up, this was maybe going to be it. This was the time they had come for the vol enough. And most of these, most of these straddles had been hit enough and hit enough and hit enough that we seemed like we were poised for some outperformance. And early on, it seemed like maybe I was right. Then the worm immediately turned, Matt. So it does not seem like we are, we are in place for that again, but catch us up, run it down for us. What's this season like? Are we in yet another blood red apocalypse season for vol buyers, sir? So I'm not sure what this means, but Oracle uh, had a 120% mo- um, actual move, and it was greater than expected. But that is a complete anomaly, Mark. Yeah, I saw that one. That got me excited. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but you know, if you look at the reports that you guys put up that I that we send over, and we graph it. You know, we put the green and then and then the red on the bottom, and you know, in a sorted column, and it's just blood red most most every day and what that means is the expected earnings move from the straddle you know we look at that straddle and we take out the expected straddle afterwards so we do some some fun and games to it but that's the uh the expected earnings from the straddle uh versus the uh, actual earnings move it has been except for oracle uh pretty poor again mark um not as bad as 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 uh what we saw earlier in the year but you know, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but, you know, we're down. We usually get a win ratio of about 40 percent. We're down to 32 percent. We usually have an actual versus implied of about, you know, 199.98. We're down at 77 percent. Um, and whereas our, uh, you know, 12 quarters average used to be 99 percent, it's been so bad this year. We're down. It's dragged the whole average down to 93%. So what that means is this year has been uh, bad for, for option straddle owners. Uh, and, you know, th- there are names out there that, uh, you know, that have moved and maybe make some headlines, but, you know, for the most part, there's uh, there's, there's not a whole lot of fun. Nike's coming out. Um, you know, they're expecting, you know, they've actually brought that down pretty good. Uh, they're expecting a move of $7 and 11 cents. It's, it's average uh, you know, seven dollars and thirty eight cents. What else have we got? You know, so just you know, a, a lot of those are are, are pretty close to uh, to what their their uh, averages have been, even in this uh, in this routing that we've seen, Mark. So yeah, hate to be the bearer about news, but uh, the option owners haven't been doing that well in these earnings. Yeah, you know, you even yanked the rug out from under me, Matt, because in your earnings season report, we actually had one week. That was over 100%. It was week four. It was at 101%. And week three was pretty close. It was at 99%. So it seemed like there was some hope. But then you've gone back and revised those down. And now week four is 99%. And week three is 95%, Matt. So we have yet another season where not even a single week broke the 100% level, sir. So you're killing me out there. Yeah, I know. I, I hurt you. Uh, what we do is we filter those out by volume. And, and if if a stock falls out of the volume, unfortunately, it comes out of that. So we went under... Uh, it is one of the few seasons where you didn't, un, you know, what we do is we break it down by earnings week. And it's actually pretty interesting to watch because weeks three and four are usually are, are strong weeks. And we could usually uh, be buying uh, in uh, on week four. But uh, I teased you and I apologize for that, Mark. I blame you, sir. But speaking of the unders, it is time to get to your questions. It is time for the volatility voicemail. It's time to share your thoughts and opinions with your fellow volatility traders. It's time to check the volatility voicemail. Make your voice heard by dialing 779-669-4VOL. Posting a comment on the optionsinsider.com. Sending an email to questions at the optionsinsider.com. Or posting your questions to twitter.com slash options. 
or facebook.com slash the options insider. All right. Since we're talking about over unders, let's get to it. Our question of the week out there for you folks, you know, about a month ago, almost exactly is close to when VIX closed below 20 for the first time, 1997 ever so briefly. So we asked you at that time, Hey, one month from now, Will VIX be above or below 20? You guys overwhelmingly came in, a little, about two-thirds saying above 20, only about a third saying below 20. Fast forward about a month, and we're back in that range again. Obviously, above 20 was the right answer last time. But we thought we'd put that question to you again. We're starting to threaten that 20 handle again. Mr. Meatball's talking about the great sucking sound to the south there, below 20 with all this gamma. So what do you folks think? Do you think a month from now, will VIX be above or below 20? And uh, so far, it looks like our audience is pretty much almost exactly the same as they were last time. About two-thirds saying above 20 and about a third saying below 20. Mr. Spike's father, you were leaning earlier and kind of hinting at your at your crystal ball pick coming up, uh, saying it might be a little bit lower. You're also saying you kind of believe this, this gamma suck to the south there for Vic. So what are your thoughts about what our audience is saying? And, and if you have a vote, have at it, sir. Oh, I, I vote firmly the way that I think our panelists are. I think I think it, it, the sucking sound is for real. And yes, definitely going to go below 20. Interesting. Mr. Meepo, I have a feeling I know where you're leaning on this poll. But uh, what are your thoughts about our audience kind of steadfastly remaining north of 20 a month from now, sir? Yeah, I mean, uh, that's the re- it's a recency bias. And as an expert on sucking, I can tell you that uh, I can hear sucking sound right now <laughs> and uh out of the mix <laughs> i think we'll all agree with you you are definitely the panel's leading expert on, uh, on sucking out there. all right mr matt same question for you <laughs> what are your thoughts meatballs killing me here what are your thoughts on our, our panels or i should say our audience's thoughts and where are you falling on this sir a month from um, now i'm still i'm still laughing so um you know, I was going to say 19.99 is going to end, but I'm going to say 20.01 because just to barely above 20, Mark. Just uh, a mess. You know, I think this curvature is going to support it. Well, you were talking earlier about, you know, the farther futures are around at 28. So maybe there'll be, there'll be the maintenance while it's getting sucked down to the front there. Those futures will steadfastly cling to it and keep it above 20. So far, you folks are saying above 20 a month from now, get over there at options, make your voice heard. This will run for a couple of days into the weekends, give you folks who listen to the podcast time to vote out there. All right, other questions. Simon, this came in a week or two ago. I wanted to save it for you, though. It came in from Nick's Vix. He wants to know, what is the status of V-spikes? Is it being disseminated yet? Now, I know Tom and others have said it is being disseminated. You guys are calculating it, but it's all behind the scenes, nothing, nothing available for public consumption yet. So why don't you give our listeners an update on on the status of V-spikes, sir, and maybe when they can expect to have it in their hot little hands? Yeah, that's a good question. It's, it's one that's top of our mind for sure. You know, we, 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 we would have hoped that this would have been up uh, quite a while ago. It's, it's just um, something technical. It's nothing that's major. I would imagine um, in a couple of weeks' time, it should be out and, li- uh, out and live. I mean, as, as you know, it, it is in beta testing and it, it, it's, it's functioning exactly as it should, but um, we want to test it just a little bit longer to make sure that there's sort of no snappers or whatever going on uh, once we launch it. Yeah, I was going to say, my guess is that the big holdup is they're still not sure on the branding and they they realize the mistake of not going with Viking. I'm so you're going to bring up Viking again, aren't you? <laughs> you really want those marketing dollars for the branding purposes of Viking. He does. No, look, he's, he's, he's got an opinion and he's sticking to it, as he should. So <laughs> maybe that's why it's slow. But yeah, it, it'll, it'll, be around, um, it'll be around in a couple of weeks. Oh, cool. So we can finally add that to our rotation here on the show. And speaking of rotations, it is time to rotate on that most difficult, that most dangerous of segments. It is time for the crystal ball. It's time to peer into the future and reveal what the volatility gods hold in store. It's time to look into the crystal ball. All right, everybody. Welcome to the crystal ball. You know, (laughs) Mark and I did the weird thing last week where we kept our predictions from the week before. I don't think I've done that in quite some time. I don't think any of us have collectively as a group just said, let's punt. 
to the week because we missed it terribly last week. Let's punt and keep it this week. And so we kept our predictions from two weeks ago coming into this show, which was I was at 24 double. Mr. Meatball was at 22 22. One of those looks a little bit better than the other. I was a little high at 24 half because coming into the end of the show here, we're seeing, seeing spikes right around a 21 half and VIX cash right around a 21. So both of us, even though if you go by the spikes level, Mr. Meatball is at least within a point. So that's nice. Our margin of victory is usually a tenth of a point, which to our credit, we never changed during the height of the madness of the pandemic. VIX is at 80. Things are slinging all over the place. We kept it within a tenth of a point. That's how demanding we are here. On the show, listeners. But Mr. Meatball is the closer of the two of us, so I will allow him pride of place. He gets to choose. Does he want to go first, or does he want to pick someone else to go first? Have at it, sir. You know what? Let's uh, let's let Matt go first. He's, uh, you know, we haven't heard from him in a while, and uh, I, li- I like putting the pressure on. Oh, there you uh, go. An, an ignominious honor, Mr. Matt. You are now allowed the pride of place to go first. What are you thinking for this time next week from a VIX cash and a spikes perspective, sir? Well, I, I think it's too easy to do it in tenths, so I'm going to go with one hundred. So I'm going to say twenty point oh one. <laughs> you're going for that one as well, okay? The twenty point. I thought you were saying that was a month from now, but you're going for it this Friday as well. So we're getting there yeah. pretty quick. Twenty point oh one. <laughs> there you go. Now, Matt, due to his own request, he has to be within a one hundredth in order to win. So if it's at twenty point oh three next week. Matt loses. Just remember that, listeners. He wanted it. That's by his own request. All right, since we're going guests, let's go Mr. Simon next. Mr. Simon, sir, what are you feeling for this time next week? Sorry, yes, 19 even. I think. 19 even. Oh, getting shy of the 20 hand. Simon, he is putting his money where his mouth is. He says the great sucking sound of VIX will suck it below the 20 handle. Interesting stuff afoot out there. Uh, Mr. Meatball, since you were the closer of the two of us last week, I'll allow you to choose. Do you want to go for last or do you want me to go last? Uh, you know what? I'm gonna, you're going to end up being on the high end. So I'm going to go on the low end. Uh, I'll go in front of you. Let, we'll go with the, the greater of the marks first. Um, and, uh, and we'll do... I'm going to go <laughs> with... A, uh, a, an 1801. I'm going to go for the, the all time vol suck. Wow. Whoa. That, that's a, uh, you're going for an annihilation <laughs> over there. Wow. You know, some might say the suckier of the marks, but hey, you know, to each their own. It's a very, uh, it's a very uh, subjective thing. All right. So we've got an 1801, a 19, and a 2001. Quite the quite the range out there. You're right. I'm going to be north of an 1801. I think that's that's a fairly safe, fairly safe uh, prognostication. The question is, am I going to join the party below the 20 handle or not? And you know, I was just joking with the Rock Lobster on this yesterday, and he was talking about how Vix gets to about 21, 60, 21 half, and then it just bounces north all the time, and he's throwing a lot of money away on that 21 put strike in VIX over the past few months. So it does have this this flavor to it where it does seem to want to get down here, and then it just fades everybody out. Something crazy happens. Something drives it back north like we saw last week. So that could certainly be in the offing. So that's a long way around to saying I don't think, don't think I'm going to go shy of the 20 hand. I'm going to go I don't want to be this close to Matt, but I kind of have to be. I'm going to go 20 and a quarter. So that's our market listeners. 20 and a quarter for me this time next week, followed by Matt at a very demandingly precise uh, 20.01. Remember, if it's 19.99 or 20.03, he loses. So bear that in mind uh, by his own personal request. I don't make up that rule. And then Simon at a 19 even and the meatball coming in at the mother of all suckage, 18.01. All right, everybody. That music means we've come to the end of another volatility journey. Hopefully you think this journey didn't suck. (laughs) If you have questions or comments or suggestions or products you'd like to see us talk about on the show, hit us up. Let us know. We do love to hear from you folks. Let's see what everyone else is working on. Let's go around the horn. Let's start with Mr. Matt, sir. If folks are interested, they want to check out your earnings data. Maybe they want to check out some of your back testing, all the other things you, you folks are cooking up over there at Orats. Where should they go? What should they do, sir? So I'm reading the behavioral investor, and his point is that humans are not set up to be traders. Uh, we do things like uh, we trade on our emotions. We do all these things. We talk our book up. I'm not going to say who does that. We do all all kinds of <laughs> stuff like that. So uh, you know, one of the things that we're, we work on at ORATS is uh, systematic trading. So we have a lot of back testing. We have a paper trading system that you could forward test. You could sign up for a 
a, a strategy and it will trade it for you, just uh, not uh, paper trade it for you so you can see how it, how it goes. So um, that's what we're doing over at orats.com, Mark. Yeah, it's cool stuff, particularly these days. Everyone has questions about how things perform. You know, there are strategies you can do out there outside from buying calls in Tesla and game. <laughs> so if you want to you want to explore those types of strategies in a little bit more detail, getting beyond the simple stuff, orats.com, O-R-A-T-S.com. Who doesn't want to back tester in this day and age to see what you're doing? If does it actually work? You can find it out. Orats.com and Mr. Simon, if folks are intrigued, they want to check out everything over there in Spikes Land and maybe also check out a little bit of Bitval. Where should they go? What should they do? Yeah, so if you're interested, um, T3 Index, uh, www.t3index.com is the place to go. It has um, all that information there and also some contact information if, if you have any queries. There you go. T3 Index for all things Bitvol. Now, he has a bunch of other <laughs> volatility indices over there. You can check them out for yourselves on Yield. The Milkshake Index, for those of you interested in dairy volatility, you name the, the marketplace. He's got a volatility index for it, T3 Index. If you want to dive deep into spikes, of course, it's myaxoptions.com slash spikes. That's the place to go for, of course, all the data, the releases, the historical stuff, including even links to a cool little show called Volatility Views. What more could you ask for from a volatility-oriented destination? MyAxOptions.com slash spikes. And Mr. Meatball, if folks want to hit you up talking about how much you suck, where should they go? What should they do? <laughs> well, you know, I'm uh, I'm sitting here trading on my matrix execution system and looking at BXX and VIX. And uh, if you want to know my insights and how I'm trading... Uh, I put out a note on volatility every single trading day. Go to optionpit.com and uh, give us your email. And you can see me talking about the coming suck from the king of suck himself, Mark Sebastian. <laughs> yes, indeed. Check him out, optionpit.com. And if you want to see what he's, what he's using over there, Matrix Executions, the place to go is just matrixexecutions.com, the place for execution services and trading technology. Check him out matrixexecutions.com. Tell them you heard about them on Volatility Views. They will be thrilled, indeed, excited. On behalf of everybody over there in Matrix Land and Myax Land and Simon and Matt and, indeed, Mr. Suckage, a.k.a. Mr. Meatball, and, indeed, myself. I want to thank all of you out there for downloading, streaming, subscribing, for sending in your questions and comments, for listening live. This, unfortunately, concludes our broadcast week here on the Options Insider Radio Network. We'll be back again on Monday to kick it all off with the option block all the way through to Thursday, or excuse me, all the way through to Friday, (laughs) and another episode of Volatility Views. Volatility Views is brought to you by Myax, one of the fastest, most efficient trading platforms in the world. Myax is proud to bring you Spikes Volatility Products. Spikes options and futures are traded on the Spikes Volatility Index, Spike, Offering pinpoint accuracy, radically faster dissemination, and a highly transparent settlement auction. All for ultra-low exchange fees. It's volatility reimagined. Learn more about spikes at myaxoptions.com slash spikes. Options and futures involve risk and are not suitable for all investors. The statements made are provided for informational purposes only and should not be relied on for financial or legal advice. Volatility Views is also brought to you by Matrix Executions, LLC, an agency broker-dealer focused on best execution in trading workflow automation. A technology-driven firm, Matrix is led by trading pioneers with decades of experience designing and building best-in-class solutions for options markets. Matrix connects to all domestic exchange venues and multiple international exchanges and serves both institutional and individual clients. For more information on Matrix Executions, LLC, please visit MatrixExecutions.com. You're listening to the Options Insider Radio Network, the home of the Options Podcast. For more quality options programs, visit theoptionsinsider.com or search for Options Insider Radio Network in your podcast provider of choice. Listeners can also access all of our programming through our mobile app available on the iTunes and Google Play stores. 
select programs are also available via live stream at Mixler.com slash options dash insider. That's M-I-X-L-R dot com slash options dash insider. Don't forget to follow along with your favorite programs and submit your own questions for the hosts at Twitter.com slash options, StockTwits.com slash options, Facebook.com slash the options insider, or via questions at the optionsinsider.com. <laughs>